Okay, good evening. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. Pastor, of course, has been focusing on missions on Wednesday nights. And he mentioned to me, he said, I can preach anything I want as long as it's not heresy. But he's, he mentioned that it might be good for me to talk a little bit about missions from my perspective, uh, from a missionary's perspective. Um, of course, we've left Brazil now, but being in Brazil nearly nine years, he thought maybe I could throw in a little bit of our experience from our time on the mission field there. And so... Tonight I want to try to do a little bit of that and also try to bring a little bit of perspective from the Bible, I think, as far as how all of us as Christians should live our lives, our, our daily lives, day in and day out. And so this, in, in Brazil, I usually preached expositionally through books of the Bible, and so this is a little bit different for me. And also, this is the first time in almost four years that I've preached to a church in English, so I'll... Um, it's, if I stumble a little bit, please um, be forgiving <laughs> for that. But um, it's a blessing um, to be back here, and um, each of you have received us back here in the church very warmly, and it's been a blessing to us as we've come back here. So Romans chapter 12 here, you know, many times undue, undue importance is given to aspects of ministry that seem more exciting or more bombastic than, than other aspects of ministry. And so some of these aspects of ministry, like missions, tend to, see, tend to get more attention as if they're more important or highly elevated than other aspects of ministry that are just more normal or day in and day out. But what I want to look at tonight is that God usually works in our lives through ordinary means, through ordinary common things, and most times the ministry, the real ministry that we do, is done in ordinary common ways that really are not all that bombastic, all of that excite, exciting on the out, uh, outward appearance, but that God uses these little things, day in and day out occurrences in our lives, as ministry, and we should be content with that. Romans chapter 12, very well-known passage. Of course, the first half of the book of Romans, Paul lays out a very detailed explanation of the gospel of salvation and goes through each part of our, our sinfulness, Christ's sacrifice in our place, all of those details. And he gets to chapter 11, verse 36, and he says, and of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And in chapter 12 now, he turns more to a, to a practical application to, to our lives, how Christians should live now as Christians living our lives. And verse 1, Romans 12, verse 1, he writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Of course, the classic setting for preaching this verse, at least when I was a teenager, usually this, was the, this is the passage that was preached on on Friday night after a long week of teen camp, Everybody is worn down. Everybody had been hearing preaching all week. And now the home run hitter comes in and preaches this bombastic sermon about surrendering your life, about giving your life as, as a living sacrifice. And while that is true, I think we miss the point if we focus on this as if it were merely a, a momentary decision a decision where you can walk into a camp meeting or a, an evening service. You make this decision and all of a sudden you're a mature Christian. You have victory over sin. You leave the building and all of a sudden the spiritual life is easy because you've sacrificed yourself. You've made yourself a living sacrifice. I think here, though, as we study the New Testament, that, that Paul is calling us not so much to a single event, a single decision, 
as he is to an attitude that should characterize our lives as Christians, an attitude day in and day out that my life isn't my own. I'm living for God. My life is not my own. I'm a living sacrifice. And we see that also in verse 2. Verse 2 certainly implies that this is a, a lifelong quest. It's much, lo- much longer than just a quick decision. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that you may discern what is that good and perf- acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, Christ himself taught that if any man would follow me, Christ said, if any man will follow me, he must, what? Take up his cross daily and follow me. In Luke 9, 23, daily take up his cross. Of course, we know uh, the cross was an instrument of death. Even uh, Paul in, in Galatians said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I'm crucified with Christ, but Jesus says this is something Taking up our cross is a daily act. It's not necessarily a one-time decision that we can do that will solve all the problems immediately. And as much as we wish that it were possible to have sudden growth in our Christian lives by means of a single quick decision, Jesus says this is a daily, a continual attitude. And... It's, it's a, a struggle, a lifelong struggle, Christian growth that comes through day in and day out, not usually the result of a quick decision. This verse, so, uh, sorry, I almost started talking in Portuguese for you. This verse here then is a, is a challenge, is often used as a challenge to to make your life an impact, to do something radical right now, to do something big right now, to change the world. But we must recognize that this often takes place. Changing the world, yes, is a good thing, and dedicating our lives and living, being a living sacrifice is a great thing, but this usually takes its appearance in the form of ordinary day-to-day life, things that God gives us, ministry that God gives us in our, in our walk with him. It is the ordinary ministry, week in and week out, that provides growth and encourages the roots of our Christian lives to grow deep. Now, American culture is interesting. You take it for granted until you go to other countries or to, until you get some experience in other places. American culture, I'm sure it's also human nature, but I definitely say, at least from my experience, American culture glorifies or sets up as an object this idea of maximizing everything, being new, innovative, exciting, always pressing on to the next biggest thing, the new, the, the, taking, taking something to the next level, right? You see... Um, and I don't care what kind of phone you have, but if you ever watch a, an Apple event where they introduce the new iPhone, you ever see them get out there and say, no, this year we decided to kind of take a step back. This year's phone isn't quite as good as last year's phone, but I hope you all will accept. Now, it's kind of funny. Every year you come out, this phone is the most advanced technology in a phone that there ever has been. Well, of course, it's another year. We take another step forward. You know, 20, 20% faster, 50% more battery life. Everything is to the next level. And so we've got to go buy the new phone, right? If we're not careful, we take this same idea into our Christian life. Who wants to be that ordinary person who lives in an ordinary house in an ordinary town, goes to an ordinary church, and has an ordinary job? No, we get bored with the ordinary things, the ordinary means of God's grace, attending church week in and week out, reading the Bible faithfully, fighting sin day in and day out. These doctrines and disciplines that have shaped Christians for centuries, we get tired of these and we quickly look for new ways, perhaps new methods, new excitement to bring into our Christian life. We want new and exciting. As as one author wrote, about this he says we have this idea that our life has to count we have to leave our mark leave a legacy and make a difference 
And all of this, here's the thing, all of this should be something that can be managed, measured, and maintained. This is our idea. He says, like every other area of life, we have come to believe that growth in Christ as individuals or as churches can and should be programmed to generate predictable outcomes that are unrealistic and are not even justified biblically. We want big results and sooner rather than later. The fact is, though, the gospel is exciting. The, the good news of the gospel, what God gives us, is exciting. But the fact is that many times a, a faithful Christian walk can be somewhat tedious, rep, rep, uh, repetitive, uneventful, some would say boring, as you steadily grow in the Lord. The, li- the Christian's life is not necessarily a constant mountaintop. But God usually gives his extraordinary gifts through ordinary means and sends us out into the world to love and to serve others in ordinary ways. Now, I said I was going to talk about missions. So, um, it's very easy to ignore then the importance of the ordinary. And so what we often do, we, we look at many people who say, well, I just want to build up on the inside, I want to build, you have church growth movements. You have church growth movements of let's see what the people want, and it's very individualistic, very performance-oriented, uh, self-focused, consumeristic approach. And these focus on finding new and innovative ways to grow in the Lord because church services, that's just too old-fashioned, that's too boring, too ordinary with its normal routine of preaching and singing and prayer and fellowship. So what we need is a new plan of personal growth. You have that on one hand. On the other hand, you have churches who say, well, forget about our own selves, our individualism. Let's look out and they see the the need in the world. And instead of improve yourself, they say, let's improve the world. They focus on problems in the world. And instead of evangelistic outreach, they focus on compassionate ministries to the poor emphasis on social justice and appeals to make a name for yourself by leaving your mark on the history on the pages of history of the world but both of these share the same problem same uh, fallacy with each other and it, it's a it's an impatience and a disdain for the ordinary things that god has given us they share a passion for programs that deliver impressive and quick results um, observable results while breaking away from the ways that, that the Lord has given us, church and, and, and studying God's word. The problem is we've grown accustomed to quick fixes and easy solutions. But in our spiritual lives, this quickly leads to becoming disillusioned or, or discouraged as we don't, as our, our expectations aren't fulfilled. So one aspect that this really becomes evident is overseas missions. You know, what could be more exciting, what could be more bombastic than overseas missions, selling everything you have, moving to another field, another country? This especially, uh, by, by many churches, um, this turns into an idol of sorts sometimes. Missionaries, you hear it say, missionaries are the church's special forces. They have received special training to go out there under the cover of darkness, perhaps, perhaps uh, secretly tearing down walls for Jesus, going out there and doing what no one else can do. They have special training preparing them to serve in special places. Missionaries are on the front lines of the battle. Missionaries go out there and... And they say they are on the front lines of the kingdom of heaven. They're, on the, uh, they're fighting the real battles. Missionaries are the cream of the crop, right? No, I'm sorry. No, it turns out missionaries are just normal people as well. Missionaries are, are just people. They may travel the world more than, more than others. They might speak more languages than some others might speak. But to set apart missionaries as somehow in a different category, in a different realm, is dangerous both to the missionary and 
to our churches here back in the States. It's, it's, it's dangerous to lift up a missionary on a pedestal like that. For himself, for the missionary, because when he believes these lies, it damages the missionary. First of all, when he believes it, goes to the mission field and then realizes, you know what, I'm not extra special, like all of those missionaries in the, in the books that I always read. I'm not, and I am, in fact, human. The missionary may become confused, discouraged. They may feel like a failure because he realizes he's, he, he's not like the real missionaries that he's always heard of. Or perhaps the missionary goes out thinking, yeah, missionaries are something else, aren't we? They go out there, spend time on the mission field and say, you know what, those books were right. We are pretty cool, aren't we? And it, it develops into a sense of pride and a sense of condemnation really onto other people. Well, look at me, I'm a missionary. Why aren't you a missionary? And, and have this idea that, that this is the, the peak, the, the top of the spiritual chain, uh, ladder, if we would say that. Because no one else is getting it done, I must be something special. It damages the missionary. It can put undue pressure on a missionary. Um, Just the idea, knowing that people back in the States expect more out of a missionary than they do out of a human being. Yes, I said. Anyway, they expect more out of a missionary than a normal Christian, and so the missionary feels an extra level of pressure perhaps I know in our case you know we went to Brazil I fully expected that we would grow old and die in Brazil after almost nine years though God led us back to Brazil or back to the states here and it was far far more difficult to to make that decision to come back than than it was to go in the first place why is that because I went to Bible college. Everybody is expecting, well, you'll go somewhere, right? Yeah, I'm headed to the pastor or the mission field somewhere. Everybody expects you to go to the mission field and to go somewhere. So that decision really was not hard for us to go to the mission field. But once you're there, everyone expects, well, of course, they'll grow old and die there. And this pressure can be put on a missionary to really, and I believe there's, there are some missionaries who have stayed on the mission field past the time that really God would have had them come back to the states. And we had to finally make the decision that just as it would have been wrong to stay in the United States when God was leading us to Brazil, it would have been wrong for us to stay in Brazil when God was leading us back to the states. But it's easy for a missionary to get wrapped up in this idea of missions are the missionaries are special forces. But also, it's, it's dangerous for the sending churches, for the supporting churches. When a church believes this, it effectively separates overseas missions from personal evangelism here in the States. It turns evangelism into something that happens over there, far away, by specialized people who are meant for this type of work, instead of the call of God on on individuals here in, in the churches here in the states that for evangelism right here where we are. Although overseas life really does, is completely different, Josh and Bethany of course could attest to this, and others who, anyone who's lived overseas could say, overseas life is completely different, but really when it comes to ministry, I would have to say it's very similar to States. People are people wherever you are. There's different, perhaps different religions, different aspects you have to have to combat. But in many aspects, the ministry part of missions is the same. You know, people, here's the truth that we found out. People on the mission field are not looking for somebody to come tell them the truth any more than your next door neighbor is looking for someone to come tell them the truth of the gospel. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth Elliot wrote in a book how she had gone to the mission field expecting a, or with a very romanticized idea of missions. She said she expected that there would be natives 
waiting under a palm tree, straining their eyes to the horizon until I should arrive to tell them what they long to hear. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It does. Every missionary, every person wants that. Somebody there that's looking to the horizon, waiting for the person to come tell them about Jesus. The problem is you get there and just like your neighbors, they don't they don't think they need Jesus. They haven't been looking for him necessarily. Perhaps they have and don't realize it. They don't understand that that's what they need. But when we have a romanticized idea of what missions is, well, missionaries go over there and flocks of people come to him and just people get saved by the droves. And I witness to my coworker here in the States or my neighbor here in the States, and it's just not happening here. So obviously I'm doing it wrong or this isn't the place where it's happening, and missions and evangelism is over there, overseas in another place. And it damages the churches by doing this. Missions is changing, I believe. You know, just from my limited perspective, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of places anymore where the name of Jesus has never once been named, where you can go and there's it's a clean slate. At least in Brazil, now the missionaries task is necessarily more geared towards presenting a clear gospel, correcting errors that they've been introduced to in the Bible. But at least in Brazil, the Bible is a good luck charm. Everybody, I've had drunks in Brazil tell me the, the gospel and I actually do a pretty good job of it. Uh, and everybody on the street knows the Bible stories. I say, well, well, that makes for an interesting missions encounter there. So the face of missions, I do believe, is changing. But yet, there is a tremendous need for missionaries to go. And now, like I said, and now to, to, to train leaders, to correct errors. Many times, at least in Brazil, there's a huge shortage of, of good authors, good commentaries, good uh, explanations of deeper biblical truths. Um, that just haven't been translated yet into Portuguese, and there are more and more of uh, more and more um, resources now. But that's something that is a tremendous need for many countries for missionaries is to translate and to work on the the deeper uh, truths of of the Bible. But idolizing missionaries for a church then also not only does it min uh, minimize our evangelistic efforts but it can also marginalize or, or dismiss the contribution of elderly, godly saints in our local churches here in the States. We focus so much on a young guy somewhere else in another country that we forget that the elderly person in our own church here who's been faithful to the Lord over a lifespan, they've, they've lived and served God in a God-honoring way for all of these years. This person is overlooked as we idolize or look up to a, a missionary, perhaps, who's just starting out. But it runs the great risk, then, of forgetting the benefits of faith-filled uh, faithfulness of the older generation. But not only the older generation, what about younger generation of good, godly, faithful people here in the church? What about the faithful young who serve young couples, young people who serve God here. You know, is a missionary really that much more holy because he moved to another country, more holy than a person who is here in the States, obeying the Lord as best as they know how, working at a fast food restaurant. You know, God can use each person in that in their place just as effectively. The missionary, yes, is called to love and to serve people across cultures. But, but God also calls people to and equips them to work in jobs here in the States and in normal everyday locations here in the States, equipping them to serve the Lord here. And that person is no more second, uh, is not second class to any other servant of the Lord. You know, taking a, a missions trip, a summer missions trip, sp spending your your summer in Africa or Brazil, for some might be a genuine calling, but I firmly believe so is fixing the plumbing for a neighbor or feeding your family or helping, giving your neighbor a hand when he needs it most. We need to understand that 
what we are called to do every day right here in front of us is rich and rewarding because it's done for God. There's a, there is a fine difference between being happy and content in our comfort or being happy and content with the situation where God has put us. And I think that is a place where each one of us has to struggle with that idea of, well, am I, do I, is this an area where I need to push out of my comfort zone a little bit? Or do I need to just settle down and realize that this is the place where God has put me for this time in my life, and I need to be a faithful servant here? Now, changing the, changing the world, going on a, on a mission like that may be a way of actually avoiding the opportunities that God has given to a person right here where God has placed us. There's a, there's a lady I've never met her, but she wrote about her experiences as a missionary, Tish Warren, as a young lady, young single lady, she went to Africa, spent several years in Africa, living a radical Christian life, she said, to the extreme, as, as much as she could, giving away everything she could, uh, going barefoot everywhere, just the absolute minimum that she could, in a radical service to the Lord. Years later, she came back to the States, got married, settled down here in the States, and then she wrote in her 30s, she wrote, now I'm a 30-something with two kids, Living, in a, uh, living a more or less ordinary life. And what I'm slowly realizing is that, for me, being in the house all day with a baby and a two-year-old is a lot more scary and a lot harder than being in a war-torn, war-torn African village. What I, need, uh, what I need courage for is the ordinary, the daily, everydayness of life. And then I thought this was interesting. Caring for a homeless kid is a lot more thrilling to me than listening well to the people in my own home. I thought that's interesting. Caring for a street kid, caring for a a homeless kid is a lot more exciting, a lot more thrilling than, you know what, just taking care of the, the responsibilities that God has given us in our own lives. So serving cross culture is definitely a valid response to the gospel, but it is it's not the only valid response to the gospel, is what I'm saying. You know, you often hear that a, that a person can be called by God to go to the ends of the earth or just down the street. And I get the idea, and I think it's a good idea, but it's also a false separation between these two. You know, when we went to the ends of the world, to Brazil, it's not really the ends of the world, but it's close. <laughs> it's not bad there. When we went to Brazil, go, go to the ends of the world, or did God call us to reach those just down the street? You know, once we got to Brazil, what we found out is God called us to the people right down our street, to the people right around us. You know, God might move you to a different street, but wherever you are, I firmly believe that God calls each and every one of us to minister to the people that are right there in front of us. And perhaps your street is beautifully paved and has luxury cars, or perhaps your street is nothing but potholes and street kids playing soccer. Either way, you're called to minister to the people right there around you. That God wants you to go wherever you are to minister to those just down the street. In Brazil, our interactions, you know, they say uh, different missionaries have said different statistics, uh, different numbers, but I've heard 75 to 90 percent of a missionary's time is just plain uh, spent in just plain surviving, trying to live, and that's fairly accurate. But my, my, uh, a lot of our interactions throughout the week with the Brazilians were very common, ordinary interactions. I don't know how many hundreds of times seemed like hundreds. It wasn't that many, but how many times neighbor kids would come over? You don't knock on the door there. You clap at the gate. Clap at the gate and say. Omar, tem um chave de 15. Omar, do you have a 15 millimeter wrench? And of course, they needed it for their bicycle. They're always, always working on their bicycle. Uh, a wrench, lending out a wrench, lending a scissors to a neighbor lady, scotch tape to repair their, the kids' kites, air pump to fill up their soccer ball. It seemed like day in and day out. That was the bulk of the interaction we got with from the neighbors. We're small, ordinary things like this, but through those interactions, they learned they could trust us. They learned that we would 
be consistent and fair with them. Hopefully they saw a little bit of, of how a Christian family should, should operate. But all of this is something that all Christians everywhere can do and should do. And so I believe this is what Paul is talking about when he talks about being, transform, uh, being not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm not throwing a wet blanket on a big decision to go and serve the Lord. Many times that's the catalyst to start a, to a step in the right direction, but it's not the end of that direction. The end is to serve the Lord faithfully where he has you day in and day out. So I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage any type of going to the mission field. We need more missionaries. I love missions. I'm extremely thankful to the Lord for the, for the years that he gave us in missions. But what I am arguing is that missions is best done when we here at home and the missionary have a proper perspective on our role and the role of our, min, of our ministries. Not a call to do less, but a call to invest in the things that we often give up when we don't see the results in the way that we would like, them, like to see them. I think of, and I'll, I'll read First Thessalonians. Um, pa- <laughs> I don't know if I can do this uh, in Pastor Largent's pulpit, but I don't know, about five years ago, Pastor Largent preached First Thessalonians 3, and it stuck with me. And I think the title of his sermon, I should have written it down, is... Um, the Lord, is, the Lord is returning, what should we do? Or something to that effect. From 1 Thessalonians, talking about the, or with a major stress the, on the fact that the Lord is returning. The Lord is coming back soon. So what should we do? Should we sell everything that we have? Should we turn into monks and wait on a mountaintop for the Lord to return? And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, excuse me, He gives instruction to the Thessalonians. He says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. The first point here is that we should... Every Christian, in light of the fact that Jesus is returning, should live morally pure lives. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which knew not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. So he's saying, Your sin is not just against other people. Your sin is against God who created you. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us unto us his Holy Spirit. Verse 9, then he says, what should we do? How should we live knowing that Jesus is coming back, knowing that we serve the Lord? Verse 9, but as touching Brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto ye, unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So Paul praises them for their care of one another. And then finally, verses 10 and 11, verses 11 and 12, he, he tells the Christians there to maintain a godly testimony toward unbelievers. It says, And that ye study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we command you, commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. He says here, Maintain a godly testimony toward those believers, to, or toward those unbelievers in your workplace. And Paul here insinuates, he expects that the majority of the Christians in that church would have ordinary jobs and ordinary lives and ordinary places there, and that they would rub shoulders with unsaved people at their workplace. And so he tells them, your, your job is not a distraction from serving the Lord. Your job is one of the ways that God has given you, one of the means 
that God has given you by which you can show Christianity to an unsaved world. It's not a dis- your job is not a distraction from service. Your job is the means that God has given you to serve him. And use this to show others the glory of God and to take care of your family. You know, the Lord has given us, all Christians, ordinary means by which we can grow in our Christian life. As much as I wish it were possible to make a quick decision and take my Christianity to the next level just by a, a fast prayer, or fast decision, real growth doesn't work like that. Real growth isn't like learning how to do something on YouTube, right? I love YouTube. You can go on there and in five minutes, you can become a professional at almost anything you want to. You know, you can figure out how to do almost anything you want to. But when it comes to the Christian life, being daily in God's word, being daily in a church that, where we can experience fellowship and, and hear the Bible taught, there's no replacement for that. There's nothing that can, that can replace the long-term effect of, of faithfulness to the Lord in this way. Yes, we can Google something, we can become YouTube experts on anything, but Christian life is much more than looking up a quick answer to a momentary question about the Bible or about the faith, but to really get in and to grow our roots deep, being uh, striving for excellence in what the Lord has called us to. It means that whether God has called you to serve the poor in Brazil or serve fine diners in a five-star restaurant, the simple fact is that if it's God's calling on your life, then it is special, it is precious, and it is doing something great for the Lord, doing all to the glory of God. So in conclusion, in the church today, I think we don't necessarily need more conferences, more programs for ourselves. We need more churches where the word of God is faithfully taught, where people are encouraged to commit themselves to the word of God, personal study of the word of God, and regularly striving to fight against sin in our own lives. This may not be new or innovative or next level. We might not see the immediate results that we might want, but I believe it is what God has called us to in this life, and may he help us with that. Let's pray. If you'd stand with me, please, we'll close in prayer and be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the direction that it gives us in our lives. Lord, sometimes we get impatient or we get jealous of others who seem to have a a more exciting Christian life than we do. The Lord, help us, each one of us, to search for your will, to be settled in that will, and to be content with wherever you have for each one of us. Lord, it is difficult. Many times it's more difficult to be a faithful testimony at work than it is to go somewhere where no one knows you and... and evangelize there, but Lord, give everyone here, each one of us, the wisdom and the strength to evangelize where where you've placed each one of us, I pray. Lord, be with us this week. Be with Pastor, especially as he's having a procedure done on his eye. Give the doctors wisdom and heal him, I pray. And then throughout this week, Lord, help us to honor and serve you with our lives, we pray in your name. Amen. And as we'd say in Brazil, as I always closed our services there, que Deus abençoe cada um de vocês essa boa semana. Would the Lord bless you the rest of this week with a good, with a good week, I guess. <laughs> May the Lord bless you this week as we serve him.